chapter one. <clears throat> We're going to continue on from our beginning last week and uh, just kind of pick up where we left, left off. Uh, verse nine, I think might have, might have even read verse nine, but I'm going to back up just a little bit and pick up and continue on there. But uh, let's read verses nine through 15, I think. 9 through 15, and then we'll open in prayer. All right, the Bible says here, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and Lord, we're so thankful for your goodness to us. Lord, I'm so thankful for this promise that you give us here, and, and even this challenge that we read in, in this passage today, Lord. I pray that you just help me to preach this in a way that you would uh, that you would be pleased, that you would be glorified, you'd be lifted up, and Lord, that we would all be challenged by it. And I pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon me even this morning as as I preach, Lord, and as on the rest of us, as we listen, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right. <coughs> well, it's good to uh, uh, be back here this morning. And the title of my message, what I wanted to challenge you with this morning, is the title is Red Carpet Welcome. Red Carpet Welcome. I think you'll pick that up here as we, as we get going on. But uh, every year around the Oscars, movie stars are taking part in a red carpet tradition that is believed to date back thousands of years. In, ancient, in the ancient Greek play, uh, Agamemnon, I think that's what it, the way you say that, Agamemnon, written in 458 BC, the titular king has a red carpet pathway set out for him when he returns from the Trojan War. It didn't end well. Red carpets at that time were believed to be reserved for the gods at the time, and they walked on them to avoid touching the ground that mortals do. That moment of, of um, hubris confirmed gods would not spare this king. I'm not gonna say his name again, I can't say that, all right? Uh, now, by Renaissance times, mere mortals were walking on red carpets without instigating their death. Not just any mere mortals, however. Paintings from the time show religious leaders and royalty as the only ones who walked the red carpet because the color came from a red and expensive dye made from the cochineal insects. The little bugs are originally from the Americas, and only people with vast wealth could afford to get them across the Atlantic. The red carpet signifies a grand entrance. If you tell somebody today that you're going to have a red carpet welcome, or you rolled out the red carpet, what you mean by that is that you're preparing a grand entrance for them into whatever the case may be. Maybe, maybe you go over and you visit somebody and they say, yeah, they really ro rolled out the red carpet for us. What you mean is they treated you like royalty. They treated you special and they, and they made a big deal about, uh, about your entrance. Now, we see this idea of a grand entrance in other places, not just the red carpet. Uh, we see it in sporting events as the players make a, a grand entrance. You've probably seen a college game or something where they put up the big banner or the big sheet of paper, and as the football team comes rushing out of the out of the locker room and they bust through that and they make a you know they make the big deal and they and they and they and they come onto the field. In boxing and MMA, they do the same thing. And these boxers, they have a kind of a tradition where they announce their name and they come in and 
and, and, and they make this big deal. They're choreographed their, their entrance to impress and intimidate. The whole idea is to make a big splash, to make a, a grand entrance, to have this red carpet welcome uh, in, that in, in, that, in that event, okay? Have you ever wondered how you will enter heaven? Have you ever thought about that? How will I enter heaven? Will God roll out the red carpet? Is there going to be a, a big entrance as I, as I go through the gates of heaven? Uh, do you imagine walking down a path as you see a bright light shining off in the distance and as you get closer you see the giant shining walls like the, like the walls of a castle and then there in front of you you see those great pearly gates that, that we've heard about and you walk up and you knock on the door. What happens then? Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever envisioned that? Or maybe you, you're escorted down that path and a couple of angels uh, are there with you and when you get to the gate you see one of those angels as he takes his halo off and he leans into the screen and he does the retinal scan and then you hear the doors unlock and they open up and 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 there you go and you enter into the to the gates of heaven have you ever envisioned that or wondered what exactly was going to happen um, what is it going to be like what is that going to be like Second Peter, I think, gives us a little insight into this very topic. There in verse 11, it says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That word ministered there means to be provided. Okay, So an entrance shall be provided us, and it says abundantly abundantly. I wonder if Peter had in mind the way the Roman generals returned from a successful campaign as they came back off of the, uh, you know, off of the, uh, off of the field. And the, the Roman triumph or triumphus was a civil ceremony and a religious rite of ancient Rome held to publicly celebrate and sanctify the success of a military commander who had led the Roman forces to victory in the service of the state or in some historical traditions, one who had successfully completed a foreign war. And so these Roman generals were welcomed back to Rome and there was great pomp and great uh, to-do made about these, these as they came back. Uh, on the day of his triumph, the general wore a crown of laurel and an all-purple, gold-embroidered triumphal toga, uh, uh, and that identified him as near divine or near kingly. In some accounts, his face was painted red, perhaps in imitation of Rome's highest and most powerful god, Jupiter. The general rode in a four-horse chariot through the streets of Rome in unarmed procession with his army, captives, and spoils, of war. Is this what maybe Peter had in mind? Now, we have to recognize a lot of the illustrations uh, in the Bible, if we know the culture that they were, they, they were given in, if we understand what, uh, what the people understood at that time, it can give us great insight into exactly what, what is being meant by the passages. So when Peter says here that this entrance will be ministered unto us, abundantly you have to wonder if this is kind of the idea that he had that he had in mind when he did that or if this is the image that the people got when they heard what Peter wrote there whatever the reference I believe that we will enter heaven somewhat like we lived our Christian lives Peter gives us a hint here in 2nd Peter chapter 1 is how we will enter heaven I think that in this passage, and I don't know if you've, if you've thought about it before, in this passage, I think that he gives us an indication that there may be degrees of welcome, degrees of entrance as we, as we enter heaven. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm um, uh, blowing this out of proportion or maybe I'm uh, you know, making a big deal about it, but I really, I really see Paul or Peter talking about that here as he talks about this entrance being provided 
abundantly to, to, to these believers, okay? Now, <clears throat> some of them, if we remember the passage from last week, some of these people didn't necessarily have the same, the same um, I hate to use the word level all the time, but they didn't have the same degree of devotion or the same degree of discipleship or whatever you want to say it. So, will we barely enter, enter by a side entrance where UPS drops off the packages at heaven? Or will we march through the main gates with pomp and regalia? After all, we are the sons and daughters of the king, are we not? We're the sons and daughters of God, sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so how will we enter the gates of heaven? What does our passage say about how we will enter heaven? Well, as we read down through here, I don't know if you picked up on it, but there is a recurring phrase through this entire passage. And it actually starts up in verse 8. It says in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, okay, is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins, okay? It goes down again in verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. And then verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. So you see this, this idea, if these things be in you, then you're going to be fruitful and you will not be barren. If these things are not in you, then you're blind and cannot see afar off. So we see Peter dividing the, the, the believers here that he's writing to, and he's telling them, listen, there's, there, if, if you do the things that I mentioned, then, then this is going to be the outcome. And if you don't do the things that I mentioned, then this is going to be the outcome. And your entrance into heaven is going to be based on those things. Okay, do you see that? So what does our passage say? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that our passage says that our entrance into heaven depends on or it takes work. Look at verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence. Give diligence. Now, I want to stop right here and, and, and just clarify that I am not talking about your salvation. I am not talking about salvation. Okay, I'm, I believe that in this passage, Peter is speaking to Christians. We go back to verses 1 and 2. We'll see it's clearly he's talking to Christians and he's exhorting these Christians to action. Exhorting them to put some effort in. Exhorting them to do some things. And so it takes work, okay? But he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about our sanctification, if you will. All right? Verse 10 says, Wherefore, give diligence. Whenever we see the word wherefore, we need to look back and see what that wherefore is there for. All right? So why is the wherefore there for? Okay? Look back at verse 5. Verse 5 says, And beside this, giving all diligence, there's that word again, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Then verse 8, for if these things, you see that? So these things refers to verses 5 through 8. That's the these things. And then he repeats that, I think, five different times, all the way down to verse 15. He keeps referring back to these things. If these things, if these things, if these things. And so <clears throat> the body of things that we're talking about is found there in verses 5 through 9. And what does it say? It says, add to your faith. Okay, now this is why I say we're not talking about salvation. He says, add to faith. He assumes already faith. 
Because if you would go all the way back to verses 1 and 2, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. They've already obtained faith. It's theirs. They have it. Okay? But now he says, take that faith and don't just stay there. Take that faith and add to it. Give diligence to add to your faith. And what does he say, add to your faith? Okay? First of all, he says, add to your faith knowledge. Knowledge. Okay? Um, it has, let me look, let me look, let me look. I think that I have, not knowledge, it says virtue. Where is my virtue at on my paper here? Um, there it is, down there. Okay, so <coughs> let me back up a little bit. <coughs> your faith is already established, okay? It's not adding works to salvation or saying that your salvation depends on works, okay? It's adding works to your life. It's adding that to your life. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. I got a little ahead of my, my notes here, and I got excited, and that's what happens sometimes. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I, wanna, I want you to notice something here. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. <clears throat> these verses should be, uh, should be known to you. They should be familiar to you. The Bible says here, For by grace you are saved through faith, there's faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not talking about works being a requirement for salvation. Works don't have anything to do with your salvation. All right, but look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Okay, and so this is exactly what Peter is talking about here. You already have faith. That's already acknowledged. It's, it's not in question, but now add to that. Now continue to grow. Now continue to mature. Now continue to, to, to be sanctified <clears throat> and to grow up in your faith just a little bit. Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, if we take that all, it gives us the whole scope of what's, what's going on here. You're already a child of God. You're already a joint heir with Jesus Christ, as we see in Romans 8, 17, and Titus 3, 7, and 1 Peter 1, 4. We see it all through Scripture, this reference that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, That meaning that, that we have, and it actually says that, I think, back earlier in this in this. Or in this uh, passage that we preached last week, being partakers, verse 4, of the divine nature. So we already have that. That is our possession, and, and, and it cannot be taken away from us. But Peter says, don't just stay there. Move on. Move on. So now add to your faith. Give diligence. All right? That word diligence has the idea that we put some effort into that. That it's something we have to do. It's something that we have, to, we have to try to. That's one of the reasons that we're memorizing verses, right? And it's hard to memorize verses. It's hard to read your Bible every day. It's hard to do some of the things we need to do. But we need to, we need to add. What does it say? Add virtue. That word virtue means valor, excellence, or praise. Okay? It basically means everything good. Okay? Add to your faith virtue. Okay? Um, 1 Peter 2.9, uh, we can see, let's turn back there. It's just a couple pages. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are to show forth those praises, and we are to add virtue to our faith. But then don't just stop there. Add to virtue knowledge. Add to virtue knowledge. Romans chapter 15 and verse 14 tells us that we're, we're to do that. Let's turn back to Romans 15 and verse 14. Get your fingers nimbled up. Romans 15 verse 14, the Bible says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to, administ to admonish one another. <clears throat> that verse tells us that this, 
knowledge that we're to be adding is not just for us. It has other people in mind. It is, I'm adding virtue, I'm adding knowledge. Why? That I might admonish someone else, that I might help them, that I might encourage them, that I might, I might uh, give them a little push, if you will. We are to admonish one another and help them. So add knowledge. Where do we get that knowledge? We get that knowledge from God's Word. God's Word contains all the knowledge that we're ever going to need. Read it. Memorize it. And as we read it and as we memorize it, it becomes a well within us that we can draw on. Okay? How do we draw it out if we don't know it? We can't. Okay? Uh, there has to be water in the well in order to draw it out. Down in, in Bolivia, Bud and Karen Rader is the first place I've ever seen this in my life. There's a well in the middle of their, their house is kind of a big circular thing as most houses are down there and it all opens into a courtyard in the middle and so all the bedrooms open to the outside and the kitchen opens to the outside and the living room everything opens into this courtyard in the middle and in the very middle of that there's a well and you go over to that well and you can drop the bucket down in the water and and pull that water out now <laughs> we saw it up where William Venegas lived and we actually had to do that we had to use that bud fixed up a pump so he can pump it out of that well up into a tower so he has pressure in his house. But William, when you went and stayed with William, you have to go out to the well and you have to drop the bucket down and you have to pull the rope up and then you take it to the shower and in the shower you have another look and you take a, you take a shower with the bucket of water and a deal and so that's how, how you do it. <clears throat> but when you throw that bucket down in there, what are you expecting? You're expecting water to be in there, right? You're expecting to see, hear a splash at the bottom and, 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 and pull it out. And, and I did that one morning. I was getting ready to take a shower, and I threw this bucket of water down. And I'm pulling the deal up, and I'm noticing, I kid you not, maybe from me to Don, I'm not sure, maybe more like from to this door over here, is the outhouse, right? And I noticed the outhouse is there, and the water's here. And the water level in the well seemed about the same level as what was in the outhouse. And I thought, this is probably not that good. But uh, anyways, I took a shower anyways. But uh, <clears throat> you're pulling that up. And, and, and if there's, but if there's no water in there, right, then what? Right? So <clears throat> we add knowledge by reading and studying God's word, by memorizing his word, so that when we drop that bucket into the well of our lives, we have something to draw out. And if there's nothing down there, what do we get? Well, uh, to be honest with you, there's going to be something down there. It just depends on what you put in. All right? We either put in God's word, we either add to it those things, to that knowledge, or we just get what we accumulate from the world. We just get the wisdom and the, and the, and the advice and the attitude and the values and, the, and, and, and all of that that we would get from the world, from the, from the television and from the radio and from all of those things, from our friends, and, and we, we gain a perspective from life and, and when we drop our bucket down into the well and we need help in that moment, whatever comes out is what we've put in there. Have we put the Word of God in? Have we put knowledge into that? Godly knowledge? The opposite of godly knowledge is worldly, worldly knowledge. Okay? When you, you get out what you put in. All right? And then to knowledge, moving on. And add to knowledge temperance. Temperance. What is temperance? Temperance is self-control. We ought to be under control. Sometimes people will say, well, this is the way God made me. Take it or leave it. Right? No. That's not what a believer ought to do. The believer, <clears throat> God says, you need to have control of yourself. You need to get control of yourself. Listen, I have all kinds of bad, bad habits and bad attributes in my life. I have a temper, and, and, and I'm um, 
lazy and, and I say things I shouldn't say and I, there's all kinds of bad things about me, but I shouldn't just let it fly. I should have that under control. And I should recognize, you know what, I shouldn't say that in this situation. Maybe I should never say that ever, all right? And, 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 and when, when I was, honestly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise Dalton just a little bit today. Dalton was in the house yesterday doing something. I don't remember what he was doing. And he turned around to do something. And we have these upper cabinets above our bar and our deal. And he hit his head right on the corner. And I mean, you, you could hear it, right? Boom. And, and he, just, he just gritted his teeth and rubbed it a little bit. And <clears throat> I'd have been throwing things. Right. I just when I'm not kidding you, when I hit my head, a rage just blows through me. And it's like, but that's not OK. Right. It's funny. And it's funny for my kids when I hit my head and I, I, they laugh and I yell. And it's just funny. But I shouldn't do that. All right. I'm to have control over my anger. I'm to have control. It, it, is that part of my nature? Yes, it's part of my nature to get mad. But I need to have that under control. Add to your <clears throat> faith, add to virtue, add to knowledge, temperance, self-control. Bring that under control, okay? And then to temperance, add patience. Now, this patience isn't necessarily like the patience that you need when you're waiting in line at Walmart or you're waiting uh, at a stoplight in, in Billings or something. It's not necessarily that kind of patience. What, what that kind of patience is talking about, it's talking about endurance in the Christian life. It's talking about enduring affliction. My dad used to say, you just need to gut it out. Okay? You need to gut it out. Uh, we might say, suck it up. right? Stick with it. You know, you need to have some, you need to get some resolve. You need to have some patience, some endurance to, to, to live the Christian life that you, the way you ought to and, and suffer some affliction and suffer some trials and, and suffer some of these things. And you need to, you need to add patience and just, and just work through that. And then add to that patience godliness. Godliness is speaking of piety and devotion or holiness it's the exact opposite of worldliness. Add godliness. We ought to, we ought to be godly in our, in our lives. Okay? Uh, how do we know what that looks like? How do we know what this godliness looks like? This goes back to knowledge. Know who God is. Know what he expects. Know what the Word of God says about the way a godly man or a godly woman ought to live. And, and we draw on that knowledge. And remember, God gives us a progression here. And, and as we build, every, every step of this builds on the last step. And we continue to build and we continue to build and we continue to build. And we continue to grow and we continue to mature. If you, if you look at uh, my grandchildren, you'd see they're at different stages, right? Bernessa is, is not, she's not even crawling yet. But she's starting to, you know, move around and roll over and try a little bit. And, but you see William, William's running all over the place. And, uh, and then you look at, uh, at, at, at Sophie, and she's not only running around, and she's talking, and she's doing, and, and there's a progression, and everything builds, and they go from being able to crawl a little bit to being able to stand up on a chair, and then they can walk, and then they're running, and then you just can't keep up with them, right? And that's the way our Christian life is to be. We're to be building, and every step builds on the last one. We continue to work until we get down to number six, brotherly kindness, Brotherly kindness is the word for love that, uh, that we know of as that brotherly love. The word is Philadelphia, and it's the kind of love that we have to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? And <clears throat> we're to, to have that, that, uh, that feeling we have um, finished working on ourselves, and now we're relating to one another. And the church of Jesus Christ is a family. And we're to treat each other like a family. And we're not a dysfunctional family, okay? A, a family that gets along and loves one another and helps one another and, and encourages one another and admonishes one another and, 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 and it draws us together. And, and we're to have that kind of 
that kind of love, but then he steps it up again, finally, and says, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, which is agape. It's that that self-sacrificing kind of love, that love that serves one another, and not that just is fond of one another, not that just gets along, but that serves one another and helps one another and, and sacrifices for one another. And you see that as, as we grow and grow and grow, that, um, that, that these things um, uh, are added to our lives. And when we finally get to love there, we see this new commandment that Jesus Christ said, this I command you that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. That is agape. That's that charity that he's talking about. And that's that generosity and love and concern that we have to each other. And then it says in verse 8, if these things be in you and abound, and abound, okay, you're going to see these, this, that phrase several times, but watch what it says there. If these be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? It's not talking about salvation. It's talking about <clears throat> whether we will reproduce it talks about our fruit and the, if, 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 we're gonna, if we're going to abound, okay? These things being you in abound, you will not be barren or unfruitful. But if not, verse 9, if not, if these, if he, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Just slid right back into that. I have heard several times in the last couple weeks or week or whatever it may be, um, people talking about that if we're forgiven, then why don't we just continue to sin? Well, this is telling us exactly why. If you have the attitude that I'm saved, I'm going to go live the way I want, and I'm going to just do anything I want because I'm forgiven anyways, then you don't have these things and you're not abounding. You've forgotten that you're purged from your old sin. You've forgotten what God has done for you. You've forgotten that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross of Calvary and saved you from eternal hellfire. You've forgotten those things, and you want to go right back into the way you were living before. Peter says, if these be in you and abound, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful. But if not, <clears throat> these things are add-ons to your salvation, okay? But they are very important. This indicates that there are Christians who have them and there are Christians who do not have them. We have both, okay? If you do these things, you will never fall. The Bible says here, the idea there is stumble, okay? It has the idea of tripping or falling. This is going to be a great hindrance to you. If you never grow in your Christian life, then you're going to struggle all of your life. You're going to struggle with sin and struggle with temptation and struggle with all these things. And You're going to say, why in the world can't I get victory in my life? Because God saved me, but why am I not getting victory? Because you don't have these things. And they're not abounding. You need to continue to grow and you need to continue to go on. And, and there is a great reward. Look at verse 11. For as an entrance or for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grand entrance. How do you want to enter heaven? How do you want to enter? Do you just want to sneak around back and sneak in and hope that nobody notices you? Or do you want to blow through the front doors and be welcomed home? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think for a minute that we will enter like a victorious general that is sucking up all that praise. I don't think that that's the picture here. If all things be in you and abound, there is going to be a humility that recognizes just how unworthy you really are to be there. And I think that this grand entrance that's going to be provided us, this, this entrance that's going to be ministered abundantly to us is actually going to be a humbling thing. 
as our Lord and Savior welcomes you in with a grand entrance and you say, I am just not worthy for this. That's the right perspective that the believer, the person who has these things in abound, that's the attitude that they're going to have. But the Bible says that your entrance will be ministered or provided abundantly. Now, don't get some false humility that says, I just want to get there and sneak in the side door. All right? No. If God didn't want you to have this abundant entrance, okay, then why would he put it here in his word? Why would he exhort us to to add, to be diligent and add diligently these things to our life? Why would he be exhorting us? Why would he be admonishing us and trying to say, listen, you need to add these things and you need to do these things because I want to minister unto you this entrance abundantly. He wants us to do that. Okay? And why would Peter say it is my responsibility to remind you of this. Look at verses 12 through 15. This, the Bible says here, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of what? Of these things. We're still talking about the same thing. Put you in remembrance of these things, though you know them. Peter's saying, you already know it, but I'm going to remind you again. And I'm going to remind you again. Look at verse 13. I, yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that I shortly must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So this gives us some insight to why did Peter write this letter? Because he said, after I'm gone, I want you to continue to remember this. Remember these things. Peter says, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep reminding you of these things. Peter uses that phrase five times in this passage. Do you think it's important? It's absolutely important. Okay. Peter says, I know that you know them. Okay. But I'm going to remind you again. Motivational speaker Zig Ziglar wrote, Repetition is the mother of learning, the father of action, which makes it the architect of accomplishment. Peter said, I'm going to repeat it, and I'm going to repeat it, and I'm going to repeat it, and then I'm going to write it down so that you can remember it. Okay? That we might have an entrance ministered, provided abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, roll out the red carpet a child of the king is coming home let's pray heavenly father <clears throat> thank you for this day and lord i thank you for this passage and i thank you for this reminder and lord <clears throat> i know these things but i need to remind it of them and lord i pray that you'd help us just work in our hearts today and i pray that you'd help us to add to these things to grow to mature, that they might be abundant in our lives, that we would have an entrance ministered abundantly in our lives, that we might live lives that are honoring and glorifying unto thee, and Lord, that we would be, we would be found to your praise and your glory. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Help us, use us, watch over us, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be with us this afternoon as in all the things that we have to do, Lord. Jesus name I pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Go ahead and stand